made me drive home on the freeway in his Corvette. And that was it. <laughs> Haven't slowed down since. Thank you for attending tonight's meeting of the Westerville City Schools Board of Education. The agenda will be displayed on the screens in the front of the room. You may also follow along by connecting to the district's website, wcsoh.org. Click on the district link, then select Board of Education, then Board Docs, Agenda, and select this evening's meeting. There will be two opportunities to address the board this evening. The first being agenda item 6.01. The first set of public comments is relative to agenda items 7.01 through 11.01. Please state the agenda items you are referencing at the beginning of your comments. The second opportunity is agenda item 12.01. There is a sign up sheet located in the back of the room. Each speaker will have five minutes to address the board. And with that, Mr. Griffith, would you please call the roll? Mr. Bird? Here. Ms. Cotter? Here. Mrs. Davidson? Here. Dr. Nestor Baker? Here. Mr. Villardo? Here. Would you please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item 3.01, uh, district highlights and recognitions. This is, as we always say, one of the most enjoyable parts of our um, role uh, when we get to recognize just some outstanding, incredible work, uh, which is constantly being done throughout our district. So we are going to honor our A-plus awards, but before we go any further, Dr. Kellogg, I'd like to turn it over to you for some words as well. Thank you, President Villardo, members of the board. Um, you're right, it's not every board meeting that we start off with cake and a happy mob. <laughs> We prefer it that way. So this is a great pleasure this evening. So tonight we honor 11 individuals who will be the recipients of the Westerville City School District A-plus employee awards. These awards are presented to teachers and support staff who distinguish themselves through a single or ongoing dem demonstration of exemplary performance. The winners here tonight were selected by committee that included myself, Tracy Davidson board member, Diane Falsman from the city, Bart Griffith, our treasurer, Lynn Mazowski, our Community Engagement Coordinator, um, Mr. Villardo, a board member, uh, Liz Washburn from PTA, and Jeff Johnson from P PTA as well. We're all part of the selection committee. Um, and I can tell you, we had a stack of outstanding nominations. So uh, I said it to the uh, recipients and their nominees in there, and I'll say it here again. Thank you to the nominees for taking the time, and thank you for the recipients for your hard work. So encourage people to keep an eye on this award in the future. Tonight's recipients display exceptional performance in support of the district's mission, which is to prepare students to contribute to the competitive and changing world in which we live, and values which includes respect, inclusiveness, community, communication, collaboration, innovation, nurturing, trust, and accountability. So at this time, um, I'd like to ask any members of the committee who are here this evening to join us up front. I'd like to turn the award presentation over to uh, Board Liaison for Community Engagement and Communication, Mr. Villardo. Thank you very much, Dr. Kellogg. If the members of the committee and the board, uh, Dr. Kellogg, will stand in front, I'll go to the podium and we'll introduce the award winners. There were for uh, some of these uh, award winners, uh, a one nominee or perhaps a few nominees. What I'm gonna do is just introduce one of the nominees and then they will come to uh, the podium and bring up if there are any other nominees here that would like to come forward to do that. And then the award winner, and I, I know that you all have something you're going to read to each, or, or Earl, are you gonna wrap it tonight? Cause you were- I thought about it, I lose my voice. Okay, okay, we, we, we won't worry about that. Uh, first one, speaking of Earl, Earl Rom, please come forward. <laughs> Thank you. 
If I could have uh, Mrs. A Amanda Anderson please come up. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kellogg, uh, President Villardo, and members of the board for this opportunity. Uh, Amanda was actually, uh, she was, there were several uh, folks that uh, had submitted recommendation for her, uh, so I had to edit them and kind of put it together. Amanda Anderson is an A-plus employee. She currently teaches reading K through three, but is, is involved in many of the other aspects of the school that go well beyond her role as a reading teacher. Amanda supports the school district's mission to prepare students to contribute to the competitive and changing world in which we live in several ways. She helps to coordinate summer visits with the Westerville Public Library to our students who live in nearby apartment complexes. She eagerly volunteers to be a part of district initiatives to provide inter intervention to our neediest students. Amanda has been known to come to school early to tutor students. She has been involved in teaching in our, summer, in our district summer intervention program for several years. She has taught in the winter reading intervention program that we have run in our district as well. Besides contributing to district initiatives, Amanda gives 110% to our school initiatives. She has participated in every staff book study that we have offered. Those include studies involving best practices in teaching, such as positive behavior reinforcement, inquiry-based learning, writing development, and the 17 things great teachers do differently. She participates in our school student support team meetings each week, providing detailed and valuable data for our struggling students. Each year, she plans a literacy night for Ann Hurst families with her fellow reading teacher. Amanda is also on the committee that coordinates our yearly volunteer breakfast. She often has creative ideas as to how we can show our parent and community volunteers how much we appreciate all that they do for our school. This year, Amanda has worked with our PTA to create a reading program in connection with the Westerville Senior Center that will provide tutoring services for our students in reading. She has communicated with the Senior Center and they have advertised the program so that they can come, so some of their members can come and help our students. Amanda has even helped, even helped coordinate with her church to help provide financial assistance for some of the families that have fallen on hard times. Her thoughtfulness and giving never ceases to amaze those that are lucky enough to call her a friend and colleague. As you can see, Amanda Anderson exemplifies all of the district's core values. She gives respect to everyone she meets. She is careful to be inclusive in all of her endeavors. She connects with our community in many ways. She communicates with kindness and compassion for everyone she meets. She's a team player who is always willing and eager to collaborate with her colleagues in order to do what is best for our students. She's innovative with her ideas for the program that she heads within our school. Amanda's nurturing spirit is evident in how much she cares about the people in her life and the empathy she shows for others. The only thing that surpasses Amanda's greatness as an employee of the Westville City School District is her humble character and her positive intent in every aspect of her life. She approaches, such th she approaches each thing she does with genuine goodness. She is truly a non-sung hero of our schools and deserves to be recognized as an A-plus employee for our school district. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> to uh, read the next nomination, introduce the next award winner, uh, Jeff Will, please come forward. Thank you. If I could ask Karen Gabay to please come up. We are happy and pleased to be here tonight to celebrate all of the A-plus award recipients tonight, especially our Karen Gabay from the Westerville City Schools Enrollment and Family Resource Center. Karen's willingness to go above and beyond normal expectation in support of our students and families in the district. Karen works and lives her life consistent with the district's values, including respect, inclusiveness, community, 
communication, collaboration, innovation, nurturing, trust, and accountability. Karen fosters her staff like a family, and I guess that's why we all keep coming back. I have the pleasure of know I've had the pleasure of knowing Karen and working with Karen for almost over 25 years, and I am happy to call her a friend as well as a colleague. Karen, you deserve this award, and we're very, very proud of the hard work that you put in and the family that you keep at the Enrollment Center. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> to read the next nomination, introduce the next award winner, Lucy Rader Brown. Please come forward. Good evening. I'd like to invite my colleague Vicki Moss up to stand with me to present the award. And if Kim Glasser and Shelley Seabury would join us up here, please. Shelley Seabury and Kim Glasser are teachers at Mark Twain Elementary. These two teachers go above and beyond to provide enriching classroom experiences for all of their students. They have taken a particular interest in the success of the English learners in their classrooms. During the school year, they developed their own winter intervention program. Students stayed after school two days per week for one hour of additional learning opportunities. As the school year ended, the teachers did not want to see this extra small group support end. So this past summer, they organized and facilitated a summer experience for fourth and fifth grade ELs at Mark Twain so that these students could continue their learning throughout the summer. In cooperation with the Northern Lights branch of the Columbus Metropolitan Library System and our own transportation department, Shelley and Kim facilitated a tutoring opportunity two times per week for two hours each during the months of June and July. EL students in grades four and five living in the Abbey Lane apartment complex were invited to participate in this summer tutoring program. During these tutoring sessions, students got extra help with reading, utilized online programs such as Lexia, and learned how to apply for library cards and check out books at the library, while at the same time participating in the summer reading program at the library. Students were transported by bus, and Shelley and Kim arranged to have a Chromebook cart transported as well, so that students could utilize computers while at the library. At the end, students gave their own testimonies about their summer experience. We commend these two teachers for their endless hours of preparation and time during the summer to provide continued learning for their students. Thank you, Kim and Shelley. Thanks, Kim and Shelley. <laughs> to introduce the next award winner and to read the nomination, uh, Jennifer Winters. I'd like to ask Gertie Glass to join me up here, please. I'm honored to be standing up here today to talk about this remarkable person who is very deserving of this award, Gertie Glass, Director of Special Education for West Jerusalem City Schools. Gertie is dedicated to preparing students to contribute to the world they will live in after graduating from Westerville. Since Gertie has become the director, she prides herself in finding and implementing research-based curriculum that will be used with our students who have disabilities. This type of curriculum will assist our students because they are learning in a systematic way that targets specific deficits such as decoding words, comprehending reading, as well as learning to write proper sentences and paragraphs. 
Gertie has already worked to put in place a phonics, writing, and executive functioning curriculum since she became director. Gertie continues her vision this year by working with the district curriculum department to research materials for our students that are on an alternative curriculum. We believe that Gertie will continue to be dedicated to this goal until each student has access to a curriculum that can help them grow and achieve. Although Gertie does not work directly with students, she supports her staff on a daily basis to collaborate in decision making that will impact children with disabilities in the Westerville schools. Gertie's door is always open, and she makes time to discuss student situations with the special education coordinators, teachers, and other support staff. Even though we have over 2,000 students in special education, Gertie has found a way to be connected to any student or family who is experiencing difficulties. She may not be able to help them directly, but she empowers the staff around her so that they are able to effectively support these families and students. Gertie exemplifies extraordinary leadership, ability, and works hard daily to grow a strong administrative team. You can often hear Gertie saying, I want my staff to be happy, because then they can give the students what they need to learn and grow. You can also hear her say, take care of yourself, so that you can be the best you can be for our students and staff. We believe Gertie is a servant leader who promotes on a daily basis going above and beyond expectations to support students. When you work with Gertie, it is an expectation that students come first and all decisions being made are with them in mind. When we look at the district values, we believe Gertie has behavior consistent with all of them, but especially in the areas of nurturing, trust, and accountability. Each and every day, Gertie pushes herself to be the best director she can be by researching and learning new information, responding to staff in a timely manner, and collaborating with those around her. Not only does this make her a better person, but it also sets a wonderful model for the special education staff. The special education administrative team knows that Gertie supports us, pushes us to be better, and holds us accountable to put students first and uphold the values of the district. Thank you, Gertie. Thank you. Thank you, Gertie. <laughs> to introduce the next award winner, Mr. Wes Elifritz. This time I'd like to uh, uh, welcome up Miss, Mrs. Kim Mullahan. Dr. Kellogg and members of the board and, and, and uh, Mr. Griffith, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, Kim Mollahan is the epitome of positive public relations. In her role as secretary for Westerville North Athletics, Kim wears many hats. She takes care of budget items, transportation, scheduling, confirms officials on a daily basis, orders our awards, assists with warrior athlete leadership team members, completes our scholar athlete awards amongst many, many more daily tasks. Her organization is top-notch and allows our athletic office to work seamlessly. Her greatest attribute, however, is her welcoming smile and demeanor to everyone who enters our offices. She truly makes each person feel like they are the most important person she will encounter each day. This is true how she speaks with folks on the phone as well, even when they don't deserve it. Uh, <laughs> in her new role as theater director, as she's returning as our theater director, she must now juggle the demands of two high-stress positions and spends many, many late, late evenings completing items with her theater students and then returns back to the athletic office to continue daily tasks. Many times I'll receive an email or a text after 10 o'clock to show she's still finishing things up. Most of the time I don't, I don't get the email or text until the next morning because I'm already in bed. Uh, <laughs> 
Everyone that comes across Kim Mollahan's path on a daily basis truly feels cared about. Her attitude and spirit are infectious and are direct attributes of the athletic and theater culture we are building at Westerville North. The Warrior Way was created many years ago, but folks like Kim Mollahan ensure it's alive and well in 2017 for the warriors that enter our building each day. Thank you. Kim. Story of my life, oh. right there. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Lost my place. The next award winner will be introduced by Angie Irvin. Please come forward. I'm four foot nothing. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, see, thank you. You're welcome. Size of a small child. Um, I would like to welcome up Chelsea Ponsini. Um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Kellogg, President Villardo, and members of the school board for this opportunity. Um, Chelsea is one of the most caring and compassionate people I know. She works in our autism unit at Hawthorne. Uh, she works daily with our students, giving them the tools they need to be successful every day. She's patient, kind, and always puts the needs of our students she works with above everything else. The students love her, and she's able to connect with each of them individually daily. Chelsea has worked at Hawthorne for three years, and in that time, she has done amazing things for the staff and students. She comes to school each day, willing to help in, in any way and wherever she is needed. In her free time, she volunteers as an officer for our PTO. She attends many, if not all, of our after-school events to help wherever she can and has great rapport with our parents. Chelsea also frequently attends the after-school activities of our students outside of school. During dismissal each day, she not only helps get her students safely where they need to be, but she stays to assist the office staff and teachers to ensure that all of our Hawthorne students get home safely. There is not a day that goes by that I do not hear from one of our staff members, thank goodness for Chelsea, or if not for Chelsea. Her caring nature and willingness to go the extra mile for our staff, students, and families of Hawthorne are some of the many reasons that Chelsea Ponsini deserves this a award. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks, Chelsea. <laughs> uh, to introduce our next award winner, Beth Della Santa. Good evening. I'd like to ask Sean Ring to come up. Um, and I'd like to introduce myself. I'm a parent in the district, and I have two sons at Blendon, and then my oldest is at North, where is why I know um, Sean. I nominated Sean Ring for the A-plus award for his undying commitment to the students and athletes whom he works with. 
Mr. Rain consistently goes above and beyond his required duties as a teacher and as the head baseball co coach at North in many ways. One way I have witnessed him doing this was when he gave up his planning period on a consistent basis to work with my son, who was struggling academically. Not only did Mr. Ring help him with his work, but he talked to my son about life outside baseball and about the importance of academics. Sean also took the time to contact my son's teachers to inquire about how he can be of assistance. Whenever I thank Sean, he's very humble and tells me he thinks of his students and players as his own kids. In short, Sean wants all of his students and athletes to be well-rounded, awesome human beings who can give back and who also see the importance of hard work on and off the baseball field. For these reasons and for many more, which I do not have time to mention, Sean deserves this award. Uh, Deb Asta will be presenting an award to Brian Shanks. He's unable to be here this evening, so he will get his award at an upcoming uh, Huber Ridge staff uh, meeting. So I wanted to know that um, uh, Brian Shanks, some of you may not may know him, and he, he was an award winner as well, but just couldn't be here. Uh, the next award uh, winner will be introduced by Sarah Dittrich. If I could please have Lisa Smith join me. Um, this was on behalf of myself and Noelle Spreesterspa. Lisa is an incredible human being and educator, an integral part of Westerville South. Though she primarily works with students with IEPs, she can be found in the halls each day smiling, greeting, and connecting with all of South's students. When we see her in action with students, it consistently amazes us how she makes all students feel valued and included. Some of the things we have seen her doing that go above and beyond to connect with both students and staff are creating a lunch bunch to help students have a safe space to connect and socialize with other students, working with students on IEPs on their speech and language goals in small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, or in the classroom, looking at the whole student, their lives, interests, and challenges, and meeting the students where they are, and she takes time to learn about what they care about, engaging them in movies, fashion, sports, and more. We see her building trust and learning about the challenges and dangers in the lives of our students that might have otherwise gone unnoticed, going to support students at their school events and activities, preparing individual good luck testing bags with pencils and erasers, candies, and other goodies to support her students, volunteering with our school's positive behavior support group, being the customer for the school play, being a mentor to new teachers in the building and providing meaningful feedback to help teachers learn and grow in their jobs. She also serves on the professional board of Ohio SLPs as president and in other capacities. She is currently serving as our special education department facilitator too. Additionally, we see her helping others by discussing how to best support students and create an inclusive, supportive, and challenging learning environment for all students, intervening and in helping students work through vocabulary, writing, and reading assignments, helping students transition from high school to independent living, and providing a place and collecting items for students in need of food, clothing, prom dresses, shoes, makeup, and toiletries. We hope it's clear to see that Lisa not only embodies the goals of the mission statement of the district, but that she goes beyond the call of duty in representing her district, area of expertise, and school with dignity and respect. Thank you for honoring Lisa tonight, my colleague and my friend.
Thank you, Lisa. To introduce our final award winner for this evening, uh, Molly Hauer. Can Gina please come up here and join me? Gina Wisman. I have had the pleasure of working very closely with Gina for the last six years. She has had the honor of working as a personal instructional aide with a very special student for many years. This job is not only assisting with academics, but all aspects of this student's day. Gina can be seen giving her her care throughout her day. She is her voice when she cannot express herself. She is the stronger force when the student is weak. You will even see Gina at after after school functions such as choir and evening of ex excellence. Not to watch, but to work. She helps the student be as much like her peers as she can, which allows the student's mom to be a mom. Gina, I can attest that you have the biggest and kindest heart. You are such a positive presence for not only this student, but for all of us who watch you in awe. It is time for you to be acknowledged for your compassion and dedication. I, it is my great honor to present you with your A-plus award. Thank you, Gina. I said that this was the uh, last A-plus award for this evening, and, and, that, and that's true, but I think on behalf of the board and the uh, administration, um, we have A-plus people all throughout this district, and we are exceedingly, and I'm choosing my words carefully, we are exceedingly blessed to have these uh, award winners recognized, honored, and lifted up by their peers. I hope you heard the words that they said about you and weren't just embarrassed, but were in, encouraged. Because what you do is making a difference. And if a school system ever stops making a difference in the lives of the children and the staff, then, then we have a bigger problem. So uh, on behalf of the board and administration, just, just speaking for us, thank you. Thank you, thank you. One more hand for these award winners. And at this, at this time, I know there are going to be some pictures in the hallway, and as I always say, if you would like to stay for the rest of the... Okay, you, you may go. Thank you all very much for being here. Continue to get. <clears throat> Let me know if you need a cough drop. I happen to have one. So. Thank you. Or do you want me to just give you one? Just in case? I just put one in my mouth. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah, I brought a couple. You see how long they last me, right? Yes, I understand. <laughs>
if the congregation would like to move forward, you could uh, do that at this time. Uh, the uh, group, never mind. Um, moving on to agenda item. Wait a minute. I, I, didn't, I didn't say I was going. Is this where I sing? Do I get to sing? Yes, yes you do. Red card. <laughs> Red card. Cakes and hugs. Cakes and hugs. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item 4.01, approval of the minutes as read for the Board of Education meeting held October 16. We just ask if there are any questions or corrections. Hearing none. Moving on to agenda item 5, reports. We have none at this time. Agenda item 6.01, public comments related to action items. We have no one signed up at this time. Moving on to agenda item 7.01. May I have a motion to approve the financial reports and investments for 2017 September. Financial report lists all funds ending in September 2017. A motion and a second. So, so moved. <laughs> second. Wow. <laughs> Mr. Stuff. Griffith. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, for September 2017, our general fund only month, uh, year to date receipts are $71.9 million. Our year to date expenditures are $44 million. We have an unencumbered fund balance of $112,549,000. For all funds, year to date receipts, $86.7 million. Year to date expenditures are $55.1 million. And there is an unencumbered, unencumbered fund balance of $135.9 million in our bank. Questions, comments? Hearing none, please call the roll. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. 7.02, resolution to approve the updated five-year forecast for fiscal years 2018 through FY22. May I have a motion? So moved. moved. <laughs> Second. And a second. Thank you. Boy, they're the anxious motion, tonight. The motion, Tracy. Uh, I think no, uh, Richard. Oh, Richard, made it. Richard. Sorry. He just sounded like Tracy, but it's Richard. <laughs> Mr. Griffith. Oh, thank you. You're welcome, uh, Mr. President. Members of the board, this is the um, the month in which we do our five-year forecast presentation. Um, I'm sure this will be entertaining for you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we have 27 pages. I was told I have five minutes, so this might be a record, but it won't be five minutes. It'll probably be 15, but uh, let's get started. And if you have questions, as usual, I've kept this in the same format as I always have. If there's questions, stop me, ask me questions. Otherwise, I'll just keep moving forward, okay? Um, purpose of the presentation, um, 
we have to do this statutorily twice a year by the end of, uh, of October and the end of May. Statutorily, we submit this to the Department of Education. They can tell if a district is in trouble or not. If we were to project, project a deficit within two to three years, the ODE would ask us what we're doing as a plan to get out of that deficit. If you were in a deficit in the next year, you would have to pretty much show a plan that you had to get out of the deficit. We fortunately are not in that category. We do have a good forecast and, and uh, uh, pleased to announce, but this is why we, we do it. And I know I always do this every time for you guys at home. This is what the forecast looks like. I know visually, I, visually this is what it looks like. I know you can't see it, but if you pull it up online, you will be able to. So this is what the forecast will look like if you pull it up. And I always explain the uh, far left co the column over here for the people at home are the categories of the, you have revenues at the top, expenditures in the middle, cash balances on the bottom. The next three columns are the past three fiscal years, which are actual. The yellow that I highlighted is the current fiscal year 18 we are in, and the next four uh, are the projected years going forward. So you guys up here know how to read that. That's why I kept the dot on the other side. But uh, the yellow is fiscal year 18. You always end the fiscal year at June 30 of the year that the fiscal year ends. That's why even though we're in 17, it's fiscal year 18 because June 30 fiscal year 18 is the end of the fiscal year going forward. I try to break this down little by little, so I'm going to squeeze this little by little as we look down. Uh, what I try to do for this first part only is this is just the revenue. I, the, you don't see any expenditures. This is just the revenue on this side. Again, you've got the, the types of revenue on the left, the past three years, and the four years we're in. Um, I highlighted like th similar things. For instance, the top line in green is general property tax. We only have one of those. You have public utility personal property tax and property tax allocation, which is in the pink. We receive that from the state, or excuse me, we receive it from the state, but it's separate than the, of the blue is the unrestricted grants and aid, which is the school foundation. That's the categories that we have. And so I've tried to, as we drill this down further, I will keep like categories together. Uh, the general property tax, and usually if, if, if this is the first time you've seen my presentation, usually what I try to do on the top is to tell you what the forecast looks like if you actually pull the forecast, but then I also give you a description on the bottom that showed what we said in May of this year and what we said and what we're saying now in October of this year. So as you look at this, you can see that in the yellow under in the green, we're saying we're going to have 106 million 378. Well, in May, we said $105,579. It's a difference of $799,000. It's less than a percent different. So we're on the positive side there. It's, you're actually going to have that much more money that comes in versus the wrong way. The next slide is I actually threw this one in here for your reviewing pleasure. Um, for those of you who don't know, we, we do have tax abatements in this district, and I tried to make a, a slide for you because we're currently going to meet with the city to try to uh, talk about a possible change. Uh, but I just want to give you an example. When we do tax abatements for the city, uh, the assessed value is 45958000 That's an assessed value of all the property that is abated that the city has in what they call community reinvestment areas. So the abated tax is everybody's abated tax, not just the schools, the $4.1 million over here. That's abated. That's the county, police, fire. That's everybody's abated tax because when you do a tax abatement, it abates everybody's tax, not just the schools. The income tax the city receives from the abatements is roughly $4.9 million. We receive a check for $1.3 million, which is 33% of the district payment. That's the, that's the contract that we have that's, a, that's an older contract in the late 80s, early 90s. But one of the provisions that are in the contract is if we pass a levy, we, we can ask the city to renegotiate or to talk about renegotiate. doesn't mean they have to, uh, but it means they do need to talk with us, but doesn't have to change anything. So one of the things we've reached out to the city to see if we can set something up. We, we current have, currently have a meeting for November 8th to talk about the possible uh, discussion about is there a possibility we could receive more money from the state or not. Again, they don't have to, but at least they're willing to talk to us about that. So. I threw that in there for you. We did have a lot of abatements that come off uh, the books in fiscal year sev uh, 17, excuse me, calendar year 17. There's a bunch that come off, which will be about a $500,000 increase in revenue to this district for our portion. Uh, and, and when you look at the abated tax of $4.1 million, we, we receive, the district receives about 90% of that. Okay. So just threw that in there for, for you to see. 
public utility personal property tax, which is the homestead rollback uh, in pink. Um, we are, you can see we're supposed to have 3.5 million in public utility this year. Uh, it's actually up $4,000 and the property tax allocation is actually down $47,000. So uh, not much of a change, um, but still a change. Uh, state foundation. You won't see much of a change here either. We know what the two-year biennium budget is. Uh, you won't see much of a change. Um, one of the things I did want to highlight for the state foundation, I put it in red. For those of you who don't know, um, the state foundation, we are considered a capped district, which means this, because we, of the way the foundation formula works, the state owes us uh, about $8 million this year. Uh, but they're unwilling to pay that. We're not the only cap district in the state of Ohio. There's others. Uh, Owen Tangy is a big one that's capped. But what this means is when the state says we're going to give you a 3% increase in funding each year, which we know what the biennium is for the next two years, and in the forecast we have 3% as well for the next three, uh, three years after that. But it's, a, it's an assumption because we don't want the state's going to do. But we are a cap district. If we were to get all the funding that we should receive from the state, uh, they would write us another check for $7.8 million, uh, but we won't see that because that's, that's how it works. It doesn't go into a bank. That means we eventually get this. It's just wiped off. Okay. And why, just for people's awareness, why are we capped? Well, the state will say that if, 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 they, owe, if they paid everybody what they were owed, there's not enough budget in the, in the budget to do that, not enough money in the budget to do that. So they try to come up with a calculation to, to determine if we pay everybody X number of dollars, how much can we not pay? And then how much is not paid is determined in the state foundation as far as that money has to be just wiped off because there's not enough to pay what everybody is owed. And so, and I don't want to go down this road too far because we'll get, we'll get just buried in it. And so their formula says you deserve, you earn, you get this, their formula. Yes. And then they have to come around with another formula to take off part of that yes. formula. There, right. There are other capped districts that don't receive money as well so that all the money that's in the state budget for schools, that's all they have. There's only so much money that they can pay out. Sure. And I get that. I, I just would... Uh, encourage them maybe to come up with a different formula. I don't know. That's a possibility. That'd be nice. Yeah. Well, if you remember so. the last couple of years, we got 7.5%. When the state did their last biennium budget, they said, we're going to give you 7.5%. And it eats into this formula. But for the next two years, we only have three. And I, John, you had a comment. I was going to ask, go back one slide. If, if I remember correctly, the property tax allocation, that's the state share of property tax, that's the 12.5% that yeah. the state traditionally has paid on issues mm -hmm. that now goes away. Well, so that, right. that doesn't go away, but any future any new Any future levies, you, levies don't, you won't receive that 12.5%. That won't come from the state. That will come from local property owners. Correct. So that line item won't ever go up again, in theory. Um, but, as a, but, if a, but if you correct. have something that expires, it will decrease. It will decrease. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It will decrease. Well, and I think it's worthwhile to take just a second here because the, the, the numbers are really specific and it's important to ask where does the revenue come from that's being withheld that we're capped, right? The predominant source of revenue for the state is sales taxes and income taxes, right? So when we look at this, what it means is approximately $525 per pupil in taxes paid by Westerville citizens is not returned to this community for the education of our students, right? That's the net, right? This is, and, and I think it's interesting when you look at the projection of our numbers, how important that $8 million is in the overall scheme of things. It's interesting that with the $8 million that the numbers look exactly like we would want them to look in three and four and five years out. But absent that money that's not returned that our taxpayers pay, then we see a different trajectory for finances over the course of the long term. So money that our citizens pay into tax revenues for the state is not returned to this community, pure and simple. I thank you. Yep. So going, but going forward, we did project 3% going forward from state foundation in fiscal years 2021 and 22. 
uh, if, if it comes in higher or lower, the trajectory of this forecast will change as well. One of the things I, this is, go back to the graph. Uh, this this sh slide here, the very bottom line, just shows you the unfunded formula. It shows you what the cap looks like. Um, in fiscal year 18 is 10.9 million, and 19 is 10. It does drop in 20, 21, and 22. It it does show dropping. Okay. But what's that? Um, well, mechanisms to the mechanism of the funding formula would be increased enrollment, which the does not. The goes up as well. Right. Uh, because even though we don't receive, receive more money, we, sh we are shown as a, va uh, a wealthier district. As valuation goes up, you see less state money. So the cap is reduced there as well. Well, the cap will stay the same, but the state share will decrease because we're viewed wealthier. They'll assume you're, they'll assume you're collecting a local. And, and the double whammy is if you have any growth and you're capped, you don't get additional monies for the additional students. Correct. So what your per pupil from the state declines uh, because of both of those factors. Well, yeah, I, look, I, I get wound up about this every single time we go over this, but <laughs> the fact that it takes a PhD in ancient Egyptian algebra to figure out the school funding, the school funding model in the state of Ohio, back to your point, Rick, a smarter school funding model, you know, it's, it's worth mentioning that our state legislature over multiple biennials has refused and rejected the state Supreme Court's position that found this funding model unconstitutional four times, right? And the fact is, is that if you want to know anything about Ohio school funding, you have to read at least one textbook that is about that big, right, in small print. It's, it's really kind of ridiculous that it's, it's even difficult for us managing with the level of, of financial acumen that we do in this district. It's hard for us to explain how the sourcing models and those types of things work. It's frustrating. All right. Other revenue is, is its own line item. It's basically it's a catch-all for other revenue. Uh, you can see the largest component uh, written in there is, is for the payment in lieu of taxes. We do get about 1.5 million or 1.4 million in lieu of taxes. We also have uh, the board of revision. Sometimes they'll do uh, settlements if for some, for some reason if we uh, somebody's questioning their uh, business is questioning their, uh, questioning their property taxes. Uh, we would the district usually, so you know, files an appeal just so that our voice is heard. Doesn't mean we agree or disagree. It just means that we file an appeal. So when the county auditor does what they're supposed to do statutorily, if they do that and there's a, a, a valuation increase or decrease and everything was completed, we go away. But if, if somehow the county auditor looks at things and say, oh, yeah, you're right, we'll, we'll go ahead and give that to you. If they didn't do everything statutorily they need to, that appeal allows us to have a voice in the process. We, we, we never uh, file an appeal on any homeowner, it's just businesses. Uh, but, and one of the things, too, I was going to say, in, in this other, other revenue, we had a company uh, business that wanted to settle a, a board of revision. I actually wrote us a check for $500,000 to settle it. And one of the reasons they do that is when they settle the, the board of revision taxes, everything else goes away. So basically the schools get their money, unfortunately, but no one else does. But that's why they settle. But we've got a couple of large settlement checks from other outside sources, and one of the reasons this number is up as well. It's up $1.4 million. This is just a forecast compared. It shows you what we said in, in May of 25th of 17 versus today. It shows you the dollar differences by category. It shows us an increase of $2.1 million in revenue from what we did not have in the forecast in May. All right. Uh, expenditure side of things. This, is the, uh, this slide is only of expenditures. Uh, personal services, retirements, benefits, purchase services, uh, and transfers out. Uh, this, so let's break this down a little further. Uh, personal expenditures, we we're expected to spend 168836000 What do I got there? Three, one personal services. Hang on a minute. Excuse me. 95879000 is what we're supposed to, exp what we're projected to spend this year. Uh, back in May, we were, had projected to spend 96. One of the reasons are we had more money in salaries. We were able to get people like at BA zeros or BA one or two cheaper than what we had in the forecast at the end of the year. So there was some savings in some of the practices we did. 
Um, just like a side note, even for this year, when, when Mark went through and looked at, I think we had like 60 people leave last year. Not all teachers, it was all staff. But when you look at the numbers between what came in and what went out, we actually are 200,000 less in this school year than we had projected just because of the changes of the what, what went out versus what's coming in now, the change in personnel over the course of the year. Um, one of the lines, too, on this spreadsheet, I always, um, well, that, so you can see that's why $925,000 is, is the difference from what we had in the forecast from May to today. It's a basically a savings of $925,000. Employee benefits, uh, our benefits are set for next year in, in the forecast. We've always had 8%. I know last year I think it, we, we were at zero, uh, but for 2018 the, the insurance is going to be 8%. Uh, and so the, um, even though we have that uh, increase in 8% in the forecast back in May, well, we still had eight, but we, we are still enjoying a 4% for, for this calendar year that, or zero for this calendar year that makes an offset. So the difference in benefits is $689,000. Due to the change, we still have 8% going forward um, for the next four years. Um, if it higher or lower, again, it changes the trajectory of this forecast. Purchase services, we basically spend 3.13% annually. It accounts for 56% of our purchase service cost uh, for special needs students. Um, it's a significant category, and usually those are to pay for services, outside services of those coming in to support our students. Um, our costs are going up $385,000 versus what we had in our May forecast, which is a 1.84% difference. Supplies and material. Uh, district increased uh, their investment in supplies. You know, a couple years ago, uh, the board made a, a determination that we would reduce fees to our to our parents for school supplies and different workbook fees, stuff like that. That's re reflected in some of the the changes you can see back in 2015. We spent 3.2 million this year. We're at 6 million. So there's an increased cost that the board did to try to relieve some of the stress from the parents for fees when it's reflected in supplies and materials here. Plus, I know we have. Uh, uh, one of the things I think we're changing is a technology roadmap, which some of that is in here, not that not all of it's in here, uh, but there's some things that uh, Greg Lewis is uh, changing. He was he did a presentation here a while back where I think he said I gave him an extra million dollars. Remember that? And I said, no, no, I didn't give you an extra million. We coordinated to how we were doing that. Yeah. So th those those <laughs> those have changes in here as well. Okay, um, we did. I think for this year we did increase the Gen Naps. Uh, textbook supplies budget this year and the appropriations. But even doing so, we're still at only $9,000 difference than what we had in May. Capital outlay. Um, not a lot of change here. I mean, it's $256,000. We're actually um, going to spend a little bit more in there than we had in there at the beginning of the year. Um, Expenditure category has been reduced in fiscal 18 and beyond. If you remember in fiscal year 17, when you see the $3 million there, we, we advanced uh, Jeff LaRoe's money to help do Point View. And so even though the project was done a year ago, we paid for it last year. So that's why you see the difference in the cost. But going forward, it, it changes $256,000 in that category. Other objects, um, basically the biggest expense we have in there is we pay the Franklin County ESC for all of our substitutes, teaching substitutes, um, I think recess aides, cafeteria aides, custodial aides, I think custodian. The only people we do not pay for substitutes are transportation, those are ours. Uh, but that's by far the biggest expense is, is to the ESC. Uh, we did bring back uh, I think another slide I had it mentioned, but I didn't say it. I think there were three three personnel uh, that we brought back that used to be from the ESC. We brought back this year. Uh, so, we, but even again doing that, uh, we do show that the only the only difference between the May forecast to this forecast is one hundred nineteen thousand dollars. Transfers out. Um, what we do there? There's two transfers that we make. When we, uh, the, for our students who have free and reduced lunch, they don't pay any fees. 
We transfer money out at the end of the year to cover those costs so that the schools still have that money in their supply account to pay for the, the supplies that those children need. Um, so that's a transfer that comes out. It changes a little bit every year. The other one that does not change is we transfer $65,000 each year from the general fund into the permanent improvement fund, the 003 fund, for turf replacement. Um, and I didn't look to see, actually I can tell you how much is in there um, currently in the 003 PI turf replacement. You currently have $398,000 in that account. We started changing this about five years ago, We're putting money into it. That's only going to get you one turf field, which is probably one that's going to have to be replaced this next summer. Uh, the board at some point is going to have to either look at adding uh, a different amount to that each year to try to account for it, but within the next probably two years, you've got two fields that are going to need probably replaced, two to three. You're not going to have enough money in this fund to pay for it that we've transferred, but that was a help. So it wasn't, I don't think it was intended to pay for it all. It was a help. So you've basically, because of this transfer, you're going to get one field out of it. But going forward, once those, uh, once if they replace the one this next year and two the following two years, the board could consider of dividing what that total cost, excuse me, total cost is by like 10 years and putting it in there so that you could have it in there in 10 years to try to replace the other three. You could set aside enough, but you would have to increase that. So currently under the current forecast, we only are keeping the 115 in there that we currently have. That would have to be a change that the board could tell me to do later if they wanted to uh, going forward. But that's the only two transfers that we make. Expenditure comparison, you can see personnel services. Uh, we spent $925,000 less, which means you also have less benefits that you're gonna pay. Um, so there's a savings of really $1.1 million for the expenditures. Um, going forward um, staffing increases we've allocated but roughly six hundred thousand dollars in our forecast for staffing changes could be teachers could be um, secretarial could be transportation we've allocated in there for personnel costs health insurances again uh, they did they did not increase in county or 17 but they are increasing in 18 that's in there and again purchase services anywhere from one to f one and a half to three percent in each year of the forecast um, this sheet here basically, again, it's a bit hard to see unless you print it off, but I took just the revenue on top and expenditures on the bottom so you can see the overall comparisons. Uh, the revenue on top, you had $2.2 million uh, that you received th that was not in the forecast, and you spent $1.1 million uh, less than we had in the forecast. So when you put those together, um, you basically align 6.010 where we had a deficit in, in, uh, in fiscal year 18, we were showing uh, a deficit in, uh, excuse me, we were $5.3 million was the revenue over and under expenditures. With that $3 million, you've actually got $8 million now in revenue over above your expenditures. So it pushes that deficit out. I always say six point, line 6.01 and the green line is always the line you would look at as a district to see how you're doing. When you start spending more than you're bringing in, you've got to either do two, one of two things. You've got to stop spending more than you're bringing in, or if you're going to continue it, you have to talk about at some point putting a levy on the ballot. Currently in this model here, you certainly don't have to do that in fiscal year 18. Um, the cash balance actually went from $96.9 million to $103 million. So you have a large cash balance. All right. Um, and again, this is just another way of saying the same thing I said. I basically have the broke everything down as, as a summary line. The top gray line is total revenues. You have the second gray line is total expenditures. You have the green line at 6.01. You can see in this green line, um, we are collecting $8.7 million more than we're bringing in. It's this line right here, that green line. And as you look to the right of it, you can see in fiscal year uh, 19, you still are collecting 2.4 in fiscal year 20. You start going in deficit spending of 4.8 million in 21, we show 11.7 and 22, you show 18.4. If nothing were to change in this model, you'd have to consider putting a levy on somewhere between 21 and 22 because the, 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 in, the emergency levy we have on right now collects $16 million, seven mil levy, 7.13 mil levy. So if nothing changes, if this is exactly accurate for the next four years, that's what you would be looking at. Fortunately, our forecast, because we do try to account for everything and be conservative, these should, this should still push out 
even better next year. But under this forecast, that's the number you would be looking at. Um, you, we are projected to have a cash balance really at this year, $103 million, but you have a, encumbrances that we have to pay. You have a $19 million budget reserve. And so the cash balance would be 80, this yellow line, 82.9 at the end of this year. If you follow that bottom blue line out, you can see next year is 85 million. The third year is 80. It drops to 68 and it drops to 50. So your cash balances are reducing, but you're still gonna have $50 million in 2022. But one of the things we learned when we did the uh, with Moody's this year, Standard and Poor's, if you ever want to get to another upgrade to like a triple A, you do need to have a cash balance. Most schools don't have that luxury. That's why there's only what 20 of the 20 of us that are at double A one, and the cash balance is a big help for that. So, you know, even in 2022, you're going to have 50 million dollars. But it, if you say, well, we want to be a triple A, you'd have to have more than that. And as a school district, that's tough to do. Um, and somebody, I've heard people say, well, we could just spend this cash balance down for the next three or four years and not have to put a levy on. Well, you can do that, but if you're 18 million short in 22, you're probably gonna be about 26, 27 million short in 23. And if you factor that out, you might make it another two years, but your deficit's gonna be so large, you're gonna need a 30 mil levy. Yeah. You can't do it. So the line I always tell people, you have to look at, this, this green line triggers your levy. That's, what, that's the line you have to look at, not the cash balance. It's that deficit spending, because when the cash is gone, you've gotta make up that deficit spending. Okay. Sorry to pontificate. Um, this was just uh, general fund revenue, and for those of you like, charts and graphs. I threw a couple in here for real estate revenue. We're 60%. Uh, state aid, you're at 25%. Um, general fund expenditures, salaries and benefits are uh, roughly 77%. But keep in mind, because we're spending money from the ESC, that it's really not 77%. It's probably another 6 or 10% above that um, because we're spending it as, a, as other governmental operations. And then there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I had to finish with a, with a fun one. Um, I've got one person left who who's, who's looks confused. So I'm sorry. I, I, I couldn't resist. I'm teasing. <laughs> so I know finance is boring, and I probably put you all asleep. But um, we are in a good shape for five-year forecast. Like Dr. Kellogg says, it kind of keeps getting better every year because we try to plan for things that we think are in there that are reasonable. We try to be conservative. I never want to be on the other end of that saying we're spent $8 million more than we thought we would. That's never, that's not a fun conversation for me to be in. And so we try to be reasonable and conservative. And I think we this forecast reflects that. We, the same process that we've used the last five years is the same process going forward. I mean, we try to be conservative in everything we do, but we try to be reasonable. So if somebody says, well, Bart, that's not reasonable. Okay, tell me why it's not reasonable and maybe we change it. So it's like you guys, if something in there is not reasonable going forward, tell me what's reasonable, let's talk about it. And if we change it, we change it. But we try to be reasonable assumptions. And I think that's what's in our forecast. So I'm gonna look for one little clarification or question. Um, the additional allocation in the staffing. Yes. Why, why so much? Because we had... Well... <laughs> is it... Well, I mean... I mean, as far as why we have so much in there? Well, in, in the addition, so... Oh, the addition. When I first came here... Um, Dr. Uh, Good was here, and one of the things we did is we, we come up with it at the time because we were going through all the cuts, we used the term $450,000. Right. That was the master's five. We used that, that's what the number, and, we've, and we still continue to try to use that. In our forecast, we have, we have a, a staffing of 10 people, which we had back with the 450,000, we have 10, staffing with 10 people, but we don't know if they're gonna be master's five or mm -hmm. higher or BA zero. We still have 10 staffing in there, but under current terms, that's now cost, those 10 cost us more than it did five years ago. So even though we try as a, as a team to keep it at 450 in the forecast, it's, it's 600. So you're not worried about enrollment projections. That's what I was kind of looking for. Actually, well, can I yeah, pipe yeah, in? Absolutely. So we did, traditionally we've talked about 10 FTE. Yeah. Well, what we did was to protect that in the teacher FTE. So in the forecast, it's broken out by employee groups. So the additional dollars are actually other employee groups where we added FTE that we think we might need. Because what we found ourselves doing, for example, this last year was because we had this, this uh, amount, 
we were finding ourselves. We actually hired more non-teaching positions this last year than teaching positions. Now, the years before that, when we had more money, we did more teachers. So yes, because of um, uh, looking at enrollment and class sizes and anticipating um, any other changes, mm -hmm. we, we actually um, left the 10 FTE in the teacher line, added FTE and other employee group lines, which is what um, uh, right. caused an increase in the total amount available for hiring right. moving forward. So it creates opportunity for us and a little bit of flexibility. And as we modeled that um, with BART, into the forecast, what we saw was that additional FTE and those other employee groups um, gave us opportunity without pushing, actually maintaining the forecast that was really, really favorable. So we do think we've put ourselves in a position to address class size needs or growth needs um, moving forward um, in this forecast. And we, one of the ways we parceled out the additional FTE and the other employee groups is we didn't put them all in one year because the impact of the compounding. So we spread them out so it might be two or three here, something here, different points of the forecast. So um, I think that's what you're getting at. So, And, and the 10 FTE are new FTE. So right. it does take an effect if you need more staffing or you've got overcrowding and you want to do different things, that's additional FTE each year in the forecast. Mm -hmm. So if we do have uh, enrollment or you do add a program, you've got even even that 10 FTE that we assumed in there you know that 450,000 of that value if you'd hire them all BA zero you may get more than 10 we, we just put an assumption in there that to, to buffer what could happen and, and I just wondered what your thinking was yes so yeah we're just trying to be conservative mm -hmm. but yet be reasonable right and that's one of those lines if you think that you, if you think enrollment's going to grow and we need 12 FTE, that's something that we, or fifth, whatever, that's something that as a group, the board can say, you know what, I think reasonable is 12. Okay, we can put 12 in and then that affects your forecast. We tried to be conservative but reasonable. Mm -hmm. And I think um, to, your, to your point, Tracy, we spent, we're preparing information for the board on enrollment. We spent a good hour, hour and a half today reviewing enrollment of trends in the district to look at where what's happening and where the trends are so it, it was exactly to that to your question is what we were trying to address is put ourselves in a position to um, be able to create those opportunities moving forward for the district so um, and as, as Bart referenced as we looked at last year's hiring so it, it's not so much how uh, a 450 number or a 10 FTE number it's the total number in that forecast and how we manage that in our hiring practices. So as Bart pointed out, uh, as we worked not to, not to not get ourselves the best employees, but get us the best deal on employees we could get, might be the best way to say it. At the end of the day, um, we hired new staff and still on the over-under and total, total amount for salaries came in better than anticipated, which was increased staff, but at a cost savings to the district long term by $200,000. So um, I think we've, we've set up a process system that um, is making this uh, um, helpful and we're in the process of building our, our next phase of our long range staffing plan now. In fact, we'll be reviewing that and bringing that to the board probably after the new year for you all to see. So um, we, th we think we're getting at this one. So any other questions about the forecast? Because I will share with you, I, I also laid in your packet, it's a, uh, Ernie Strausser is one who we use to come public finance resources presented. Uh, there's a sheet that, that has uh, charts and graphs and different things I laid on your desk. You can look it over. Uh, mine doesn't have a lot of charts and graphs in there. I also gave you a book that's in the green. Uh, when John was first hired, uh, the public finance resources group had like a day and a half seminar where John and I went and it was called benchmarking financial benchmarking where John and I spent I think it was an evening and then a the next day and there's like 22 different topics in there that you can look at that benchmark us in, uh, compared to similar districts and uh, our similar district and other local districts that may or may not be on similar districts there's a there's a, just a tremendous amount of information in there uh, it talks about anything and everything and so that's 2016 data because it's based on the cup report which isn't out yet for 2017 so when it does come out we'll create this again for you and you'll have another but there's like Tracy said just read it if you want to go to sleep or something there's a lot of data in there that's informational that, that, that drills it drills down so far that you may not want to go that far but it's in there if you do and it compares us to other districts. so that's what the green folder is on your on your desk as well 
Uh, we'll try to get those to you next January Fe or February when that next cup report comes out and, and each year after that because they prepared that for us. We just printed it off for you. So it's very helpful. Um, so anyway, any other questions for me at all? Questions? No, I just have one cautionary statement. The, f the forecast is strong. It is healthy. We're doing remarkably well. And I appreciate the conservative approach that we take to this because it lets us get out as far as possible without new levies. But much of this is truly predicated on what the state may or may not choose to do. So going forward, we need to really keep a close eye on and keep in close contact with individuals at the state level because shifts in the formula, um, reductions in the amount that we have forecasted would make a significant difference in what we are talking about as regards our out-year plans. Our local stuff is strong and solid and I feel really good about where that is. I am less sanguine about what happens at the state level over time. We're set now. Who knows about the next biennium? We'll be on that. We'll be taking care of that. But this is a forecast and things do shift and things do change over the years. But at this point in time, this is a very strong, very healthy forecast. Thank you. Any other thoughts, concerns? Uh, as we always say, listen, you do a tremendous job Thanks. trying to make it uh, palatable, encouraging, uh, explain uh, well. I, I hope that uh, people will look at the website and, and look at the forecast and call with questions or concerns. But uh, we are we are blessed with a with a community that uh, is supporting us in in many ways, and we do not look at these dollars as ours. We look at these dollars as how can we impact kids, support teachers and staff, and uh, continue to have a tremendous district. In my opinion, uh, Mr. Griffith, would you please call the roll? Mr. Bird, yes. Ms. Cotter, yes. Mrs. Davidson, yes. Dr. Nestor Baker, yes. Mr. Villardo. Yes, moving on to agenda item 8, 8.01 through 8.09, consent agenda. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thank you very much. Yes. Good evening, President Villardo, members of the board. Tonight's consent agenda contains nine sections involving 202D30, 232 <laughs> persons. Wow. <laughs> Section 8.01 is the resignation of six classified employees and six substitutes. 8.02 is the resignation of one teacher, one licensed supplemental and one outside supplemental contract. 8.03 is the leave of absence for one classified employee. 8.04 is the leave of absence for one teacher. 8.05 is a contractual status change for three bus drivers. 8.06 is a change of assignment for four classified employees and one amended end date for a change of assignment previously approved. 8.07 is a one-time payment for 120 teachers. 8.08 is the employment of six classified employees, three substitutes, and two amended items. And 8.09 is the employment of two teachers, 15 athletic events assistants, 16 supplemental contracts, and 43 outside supplemental contracts. That time, this time I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Mr. Griffiths, would you please call the roll? Ms. Cotter? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Thank you once again. Moving on to agenda item 9.01, policy 6233, amenities for participants at meetings and or other occasions. These are um, policies being amended that we have uh, gone over. Now we'll be voting on them. Uh, any questions or concerns at this time? Hearing none, did I have for, for a motion and a second yet? Well, it's because they're so quick ahead of me. <laughs> May I have a- Let me ask you a question before we do that. Are you doing these as one motion or are you doing them individually? Doing individually. Um, is there is there any word to take them uh, individually? I would request individually. Individually. Okay. So we're taking 9.01, a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Thank you very much. Uh, any discussion, question? Hearing none, please call the roll. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes.
Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. 9.02, policy 6680 on recognition. May I have a uh, motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thank you very much. Any discussion on this one? Hearing none, uh, Mr. Griffith, please call the roll. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Policy 9141, agenda item 9.03, the Business Advisory Council. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thank you very much. Um, real quickly, Dr. Nestor Baker, was this the one yes. that you had a, okay, did you yes, want to address right now? Yes, it's fixed. Oh, it's fixed, yes. okay. Um, but there was just a very slight change, basically addition of a clause in the second paragraph where we say, in order to obtain more effective assistance from one group particularly affected by the student's entry-level skills, the potential employer, the board shall establish a business advisory council locally or as part of a regional consortium. Awesome. Thank you. I, I remembered that that was a concern. I wanted to make sure that we address that. Any other questions? Is this the one you wanted to address? Yeah, Mr. it's Bird? the reason why I asked for separate consideration by sure. motion um, sure. so that we could confirm. Um, so I believe we're all in agreement that the verbiage was changed according to what we had asked for. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and also to highlight the fact that the first two uh, motions uh, were related to uh, fiscal responsibility for approval for expenditure uh, through the superintendent and the board, and this one is specific to um, uh, operating policy relative to community involvement. So that was the only reason I asked for a separate great. call. No, no, great. That's yep. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions or comments? I did a motion and a second on this one, didn't I? Yes. Ooh, I'm just confused tonight. Uh, may I, uh, would you, Mr. Griffith, please call the roll. Yeah. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item 10.01 policy. This is new business, recommended action new business policy 2271, college credit plus program. Since it's new business, no motion or second, but uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Reeves, would you? <laughs> Get a promotion. What? Thank you. Okay. Do you see that? I'm sorry. Is it okay? You, yeah, go ahead, one? please. I was just going to ask, do you see that as a, well, I don't know how else to ask it. I know you're going to ask us to approve it, lady. Do you see that as a good change? Is that a helpful change? I, I mean, what's, what's that all about? Um, Jill's going to sing. on college credit plus and students being prepared for the college level courses and things of that nature. Um, almost all of our in-house, in fact, all of our in-house college credit plus courses are New Columbus State, bless you, and uh, we utilize uh, their work keys or other um, prerequisites that we don't anticipate will be a hindrance to our students, but um, until this is fully enacted this spring, Okay, that's that's helpful. I just I, I just don't want us to put up. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just don't want us to put up any barriers. And I, yeah. I'm I'm just uh, just mildly concerned about that. That's why I asked. Do you do you feel like this may be a, a, a barrier? Uh, 
could it be? Perhaps. Okay. Um, and it's something we'll definitely track. And when we come around, come around again next fall, and we'll look at the number of students that are participating okay. in College Credit Plus, and how many of the students wanted to participate in College Credit Credit Plus but couldn't have because of this provision. It'd be interesting to see what those numbers look like. That would be good to know. Thank you. That's that's all I. And don't forget that we have other pathways for students that, if for some reason they don't meet the remediation free score. Um, uh, we, we've opened our doors in our advanced placement in international Absolutely. baccalaureate Absolutely. programs yes. um, as a means yes. for, for kids as well. So um, Mr. Reeves is right. This is a lot of response from higher ed mm -hmm. and their feelings about students who are accessing college level courses. Don't forget this is down to seventh graders. Which is why, what seventh and eighth grader are taking college level courses? We had one. We did? Mm-hmm. And did they um, leave our schools to go, or was it something here? They, it, it happened. So I'll give you a great example. I've had, um, through my principal career, um, several students who capped out our math program, eighth and ninth grade. AP Calc is an eighth grader, and what's left? And so onward they go. So, yeah, I mean, it, um, I think it's a rare instance where you have a young person who's at that intellectual, uh, that intellectual la level, and then also the the um, maturity to manage being on a campus course, it's, it's, it's uh, a campus, so not a lot of that, but um, I don't think it's un a remediation free score in order to be eligible to take a college level course isn't a really unreasonable expectation, it's a similar expectation in other places, but internally we're going to keep our doors open for our curriculum as much as possible for kids. Um, it also provides for us a means of examining prerequisite courses mm -hmm. that we're trying to make sure align to say, okay, so what is the standard for entry? If the standard for entry is an SAT score, a mediation free SA, um, ACT score in English language arts is 18, okay? So we've had these conversations. So English nine honors, what should it align to? Well, how about English nine honors being aligned to scoring 18 or better on the ACT. And so we have content, we have rigor standards there that can be used as a better means for quantifying our differences in our homegrown curriculums that act as pathways for students and for teachers. And we've started some of that conversation in the district. So, And in fact, um, the last, this year is the first year we uh, are, are implementing the change to our English language arts um, curriculum that kind of went through the curriculum adoption cycle and one of the things that they worked on and aligned that the work within English 11 and English 12 aligned to students that would score within the 25 to 28 range on the ACT. I, you know, this is a space and this is a transition period so I'm, I'm going to be gracious about it but I struggle with this because on the one hand, we have, we have a state that's passing Ohio Revised Code that mandates significant portions of our curriculum, our testing cycle, our assessment cycle. And on the other hand, they're passing laws that are, that are fundamentally dictating that our curriculum has to be oriented towards college prep, right? That's a significant inconsistency, right? If, if, if a college preparatory curriculum is oriented towards assessment, non-remediation assessment cut scores, that is totally different than the assessment methodologies that are currently used within the state today relative to student accomplishment at grade level, right? And I'm not opposed to it. I, I've, I've always been one that said, you know, if we're going to teach to a test, then let's teach to the ACT. Let's teach to the SAT. Um, and and I'm, I'm fine with that. But in this transition, the one thing that I worry about is not so much the intellectual anomaly, right? Because those, as you mentioned, are going to be few and far between. What I'm concerned about, about in the operationalization of this is, is, is which non-remediation score. I got a kid that took a PSAT. I got a kid that took the key. I took, a, took the ACT. And they were assessment or remediation free in one, but require remediation or don't meet the remediation cut score in three. What do we do now? Right. I mean, it's we. You know, we're we're putting ourselves in a position, or pardon me, the state's putting our, us in a position where the kids that will benefit most from advanced academic placement relative to college uh, credit um, could be the ones that are on one side of that line or the other. 
and now we're stuck in, in the position of making judgment calls. Um, and I don't think they're, judge, they're objective judgment calls, right? We're going we're gonna to have to look at something and say, well, 17 on the ACT wasn't quite good enough, you know, no matter what your other score said, so we can't have you partake in this class. I, I get that it's the transition period and we're going to have to grow through this, but I do take exception to this big inconsistency in instructional, uh, instructional philosophy that the state seems to be standing on two parts of the, uh, two banks of the river with, right? And I, I would say in, in the experience that we've had with, with College Credit Plus courses, specifically to those taught in-house, every course may have a slightly different prerequisite requirement. And I would imagine that they would spell that out per the course, and that would be something that as soon as we got <coughs> that information from the colleges, we would put in our course description guide and make sure that our families know here are the requirements to take these courses. And one, there's a couple of ours that have no prerequisite requirements that we offer in-house from Columbus State. So um, we'll see how that plays out. And that's, and that's the very nature of the community college model as well. So we'll see. The other, the other trap door in this is, um, and I, I appreciate your comments, Mr. Berg, as I understand where you come from. The other trap door, though, is students who walk into these courses who aren't prepared, um, the trap door is if they fail, the cost is back on the family. So this, this bit about us being able to counsel families correctly on accessing this one is a tricky one because, um, and you're probably going to see more College Credit Plus policy impacts. The biggest conversation across the state right now relates to what kinds of courses kids can take because you'll be surprised at what's happening in some districts that, and the expense, we, we have the expense of the tuition. The other big cost factor is textbooks. And so we've, you know, if you understand the differences between how textbooks for courses are selected in college versus how textbooks for courses are selected in public school, public uh, K-12 schools, it's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And so right now the burden of the cost of textbooks is on us. Um, there's actually a legislation proposed that would put a burden, 50% of the burden on families that I opposed um, not that my voice matters, because I think it should be free. If you're in a public school system, it should be free. So I don't want to put the burden of how that's done on families. I'd rather see a better design to how that's done, but that's a, that's a really messy one if you understand how textbooks are done at the college level. So a lot, this is um, getting, College Credit Plus is getting a lot of attention because the doors kind of got flung open. Lots of kids went in. And um, now we're kind of seeing what does that mean. So um, should public education dollars, right, taxpayer dollars, be used to pay tuition for a kid to take kayaking at a local college? And that's, and that's, that's one of the honest storylines going on, as opposed to a kid who's tapped out our math program or sees an interesting course. So the other areas around not just criteria for getting in, but what should they have access to that's going to be at the local taxpayer's expense rather than the family's expense. Um, and then one of the big policy pieces that have been discussed in College Credit Plus, one of the early carrots that were hung out there was that this is an opportunity for um, families to relieve themselves of the burden of t college tuition because you can earn college credit while still in high school. Well, okay, we should now start to see some numbers. Are our students leaving us with accumulated credits and being in a position to graduate earlier, or are they merely accumulating credits going into college and, and being advanced with the same number of credits still need to be accomplished and the same amount of money to be accomplished? Um, so there's some of that going on as well. So a lot to be sorted out here still um, um, along the way. but. It is only one of our opportunities, and um, we're proud of our growth in here and, and, and our growth in other programs. Mr. Reese and his team have done a wonderful job, as we've reviewed. In particular, one, one of our points of pride has been the access to minority students, underrepresented student population. So we're going to continue pushing that one. So, it, Thank you. Got really good discussion. I think uh, board members, I think we just keep reading it and digging into it and then see what we think it comes back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reeves, very much. 
Moving on to agenda item 11.01, donations. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? Any words you'd like to share? As always, we just can't thank uh, our community enough. Um, whether it be uh, companies or individuals, anonymous donors, uh, what they contribute to this district above and beyond, um, we're just truly appreciative of. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Mr. Griffith, would you please call the roll? Mr. Bird? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? <clears throat> yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Agenda item 12.01, public comments. We have no one signed up this evening. This evening. Uh, uh, agenda item 13.01, board comments. If anyone would like to share anything before we go into executive session uh, briefly. That wasn't a threat. I was just saying if you'd like to be sharing in. Okay, we've shared enough. None. Agenda item 14.01, board will meet in executive session November 8, uh, 2017, 6 p.m. And November regular session Monday, November 20, 6 p.m. here to Early Learning Center. Agenda item 15.01, uh, a motion to enter into executive session for the purposes of personnel. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Mr. Griffith, please call the roll. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. And just to let you know, we will be adjourning directly from executive session, uh, taking no more action out here. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and uh, uh, tip your waitress. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to get in so much trouble for tonight. I, I'm just, I'm just really, I'm just doomed. Two more minutes.